Hey, what's up, New Hope? Hope you guys are doing great today at all of our campus locations on this beautiful spring Sunday. I've got a good brother here, Adrian. This is a, a man of God who is, uh, is leading his family and doing his very best. Let me tell you a little bit about this guy. He just drove two hours this morning to get into the waters of baptism. He has his lovely wife here, Andrea, and their five kids. And uh, their first Sunday at New Hope Church was last week. They're believers, but he is a man who told me this morning on the phone that he's doing his best to fight the good fight. His, his life has been characterized by heartache, his words, not mine, and heart conditions. And he told me this morning, he's like, when I come out of the water, Pastor, I am hoping and praying that God will renew the spiritual armor, the spiritual armor in his life. And I don't know if you just heard him. He said, I know he will. This is a man of faith. So I want you to just pray for him right now as he goes under the waters of baptism, as he publicly professes his faith in Christ. I want you to keep praying for this family. They stand in need of our prayers and our community. And brother, I am just honored to be here with you today. Let me ask you a question. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Absolutely. Do you promise to serve him now Absolutely. Every and day. always, every, every day. single day? Every moment. Amen. Well, brother, it is my joy and my honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Come on, church. I love you. Way to go. Way to go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Check it out. If you're sitting there and you desire baptism, we want to just encourage you. You probably noticed that we're baptizing somebody almost every single Sunday. Just text the word baptism to 59769. Again, baptism to 59769. We will get you in the hopper, as they say, and we will baptize you on a Sunday morning from any of the campuses. We'll have you over at Durham so we can baptize you here, stream it out to the movement, and continue to celebrate how God is using us. Amen, church? Amen. Hey, uh, in just a moment, you're going to experience Tiana Spencer. She's no stranger to us, like Mike Bro. She's one of our teaching pastors. Uh, she's teaching today. Let me tell you a little bit about Tiana for those of you who are new. She accepted Christ at the age of 14 years old. She grew up in San Diego, California. Somebody's got to do it, right? Uh, she married her high school friend. Together they have three children. And ever since she accepted Christ at the age of 14, she's had this passion for teaching the Word of God, and she is gifted. So turn your attention to the screens. We're going to check out this trailer before we get into the Modnik series, and Tiana brings a fresh word to us today representing the letter N in Modnik. Here we go. The kingdom of heaven is not of this world. The Bible says that we are to be in the world, come on, but not of the world. M, in God's kingdom, more is less. In this countercultural kingdom, upside down, backwards kingdom, the kingdom is more is less, and less is more. Oh, others first. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Instead, be humble. Thinking of others better than yourself. D, descend into greatness. In our world, it's all about upward mobility. It's all about higher levels of greatness. Jesus comes and says, hey, watch me and I'll show you a better way to live. G, in the kingdom of God, generosity flows. When you get people coming to know Christ, you get people following the servant who laid down his life, then generosity starts to flow. In, not to us. In this countercultural kingdom, it's not about us. It's all about God. Inclusivity. In the kingdom of God, there is no bias or prejudice. Everyone is welcome in the kingdom of God. King on a cross. Who would imagine that a king of a kingdom would end up splattered on a cross? What? Talking about fairness and lack thereof. But that's the kingdom that we're a part of. May what is up there come down here in and through New Hope Church.
Hi, New Hope. My name is Tiana Spencer, and I am so glad to be back with you guys today. It feels like forever, and I can't wait to get back in person, but for now, we're going to settle for video. Uh, we're going to be today in John chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. And it reads, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and his, her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Um, you know, they used to have this show a long time ago called Kids Say the Darndest Things. I don't know if y'all, I'm sure some of y'all remember that show. Now, when I was younger, I watched that show and I thought, this thing is so staged. These kids are not actually saying this thing until I grew up and had some kids of my own. And it is very true that they say the darndest things. My oldest daughter, who is now 14, has always had somewhat of a mouth on her. And I remember when I was, it was she was, gosh, maybe five. And I remember I was on the floor and I was doing sit-ups and I was exercising. And she walks in the room while I'm exercising. She looks at me for a while and she says, I guess I'm going to have to exercise when I get old, too. I said, why, Jada? She said, well, because my tummy will be big, too. And I looked at her and I said, have you lost your mind? She said, but wait, your tummy only gets big if you get married. So I guess I'm not getting married. And then she just walks out the room. I'm literally sitting there like, she has lost her mind. But they say the darnest things. Another time she walked into the room with me and I remember she asked me this question and she said, mom, why do your legs keep moving even after you've stopped? And I, I looked at her and said, Jada, what are you talking about? And she said, watch, she said, jump up and down. And for some reason, y'all, I indulged this child. I don't know why I did it. But she said, jump up and down. I jumped up and down. She said, no, stop. She said, see, your legs are still moving. Afterward, and I said, you know what? Get out of my room. That, is, that was my exact response was get out of my room. I learned that day that kids really do say the darndest things. But then there are some times when your kids unknowingly speak soul-piercing truths. You know what I'm talking about. You have those experiences with your kid where they just say something where it's almost beyond, it's beyond their age. They shouldn't even know to say it, but they speak these soul-piercing truths. I remember when I was going through a season of suffering and I was struggling and I was, I cried out in a moment of just, uh, of, of anger and frustration. I said, God, I cannot see what you are doing. And Jada, in her innocence, looked at me and says, Mommy, that's because you aren't up there with him. Like, that, it was so simple to her. She said, that's because you're not up there with him. And at first, I ignored what she said. But then I felt the Lord say, Tiana, she's right. You cannot see what I'm doing because you are not up here with me. You cannot see what I see. You don't have an aerial view of your life that I have. You cannot see the end at the beginning like I can. And so the frustration you're having, Tiana, is because you are only viewing your life from one perspective, yours. And so we live life from that perspective. What happens to me? What happens for me? What, what happens because of me? And the problem with that is that only having a ground level perspective of your life is not only limited, but it's potentially reckless. It's why whenever there are high speed chases, the cops know that they cannot only have eyes on the ground. Just, they can't just jump in their cars and chase the perpetrator alone. Why? Because they will have blind spots, things in their way. And they know that their view will be limited and potentially reckless. So what they do, New Hope, is they, is they send someone up in a helicopter to get an aerial perspective. And they take their cues from the one who can see the whole picture. You guys are doing a series on, on the upside down kingdom, the backwards kingdom. It's this idea that we, things don't work the same in the kingdom of God, in the family of God, in the, in the church. They, don't, they shouldn't work the same as they do in the world. And this week we're talking specifically with the, the letter N, not to us, not unto us, meaning it is not about us. The kingdom is not about us. And you know one of the ways I find that we often make things about us 
is when it comes to suffering. It is one of the areas, and it's, it's so easy to do, but in suffering, we find a way to make it all about us. And it's because we are living from a ground perspective. But can I tell you that even suffering is not about us. It's not only about us. There's just something better going on, but we are living with a ground perspective. And we have to learn to start trusting the whole picture. This is what's happening in the 11th chapter of John. John is giving us an aerial perspective of human suffering as we know it. Now, what you pay attention to is he, he tells this story of loss and grief, not from the vantage point of the one affected by it most, but from the vantage point of the one who allowed it. You see, as we journey through this whole passage today, you will notice that we don't even see the actual moment when the two sisters lost their brother. We don't see it. But we see the moment when the Son of God sanctioned it. We, we see the moment when he chose to stay two, behind two days and allow these sisters' worst nightmare to come true. We see the, the aerial view. We see what God is doing. You see, the temptation for us, the temptation will be for us to solely, as we read the story, put ourselves in the position of Mary and Martha and to feel from that place. It is natural and easy for us to get ground level and sit in their pain and their anguish because we resonate with that. It's what comes natural to us. It's how we, I've read this story for years. We know what it feels like to, to feel let down by God, to experience loss and pain. But, but pay attention here because John is forcing us to stay high. He's forcing us to take the aerial view, to see this from Jesus' point of view. Why? Because there's something bigger going on. There's something bigger going on. When he hears about Lazarus, he says immediately, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory. He sees the end at the beginning. So I want to walk through this story of suffering from God's perspective, because I feel like I'm supposed to encourage some people today that there is something bigger going on in your story. Even in your suffering, it's not about you. And I know that is hard to hear. If you know my story, you know I am familiar with suffering. But even in your suffering, church, it's not about you. You need to know that whatever season you are in, that the glory of God is all in this thing. The beauty of God somewhere is all in this thing. So I want to look at God's glory and suffering. Three aspects of God's glory we see in this story of suffering. We see the glory of his grace. We see the glory of his grief. And we see the glory of his gaze. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you. I thank you, God, that there's always something bigger going on. I thank you, God, that we are, we, there's always an aerial perspective. I thank you, God, that you are good and you are in control of it all. So, God, would you speak today? Would you give us insight? Would you give us discernment and revelation, God? <sighs> Your children are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John 11, <clears throat> 11 through 14, he says, the first part is the glory of his grace. This is what we're looking at, the glory of his grace. He says, after he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Verse 13, Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, he said, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Lazarus is dead. Uh, 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 th their friend, the one that, that they know and love, he's dead. And then Jesus says, for your sake, I'm glad I was not there to save him. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there to rescue him. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there to deliver him, to, to intervene, to stop their pain of Mary and Martha. For their sake, I'm glad. At the ground level, this sounds harsh. When we make it about us, this sounds harsh. When we place ourselves in Mary and Martha's role, this sounds cruel. I mean, can you imagine being Mary and Martha and hearing God say something like he was glad he was not there to save their brother? 
It sounds insensitive at best. But I want you to hear the aerial interpretation of what God is saying. This word glad means to rejoice in the grace of God. To rejoice in the grace of God. Listen to what he's saying. He's saying, for your sake, I am rejoicing in the grace of God that I was not there to save your friend. I am rejoicing in the grace of God that I was not there to prevent the pain of Mary and Martha. You hear what he's saying? He says, this is God's grace that I wasn't there. I'm glad I wasn't there. Why? Why is it God's grace? Because now I've become necessary. Now I've become necessary. You see, this is the perfect setup. Now my presence has become necessary to you. This is the perfect setup for my glory to be on display, Jesus is saying in the earth. He's saying, now you need me because I wasn't there, because I wasn't there, because what death happened, now you need me. You see, the delay of God forces you to realize what you cannot do on your own. Have you ever experienced that where God doesn't show up and it makes you realize how much you need him then? Because he was not there, y'all. <clears throat> if he was there, they had to come face to face because he wasn't there with their inability to help themselves. They couldn't do nothing about him dying. They, they could not do anything. Because Jesus wasn't there, they had to come face to face with their inability to help themselves, there was an obvious lack, which created an obvious need in them. You see, the delay of God often creates a need for God. And a need for God creates a dependence on God. And a dependence on God, church, is the only true relationship with God. That's it. That's what we've been created to do to depend on him. And he, and he has to set it up like this because otherwise we would walk around believing that we could actually do this thing called life apart from him. You see, for some of us, we would have never depended on God had we not been delayed by God. But can we be honest? Because for most of us, we don't want to depend on God. Uh, matter of fact, when we do get into seasons where we have to depend on God, what we do as Christians often is try to pray ourselves out of it as soon as possible. Amen. I remember when the Lord called us to move to L.A., we were living in a very inexpensive city, about an hour and a half um, south of it, and God called us to move to L.A. Now, we knew we couldn't afford to live to L.A., so we said, okay, for the next nine months, my husband's going to save, he had two jobs, he's going to save this check from this one job, and we are going to save up so that we can afford to move to L.A. because that's where God wants us. And as soon as we made that plan, my husband got laid off of that job. He got laid off. Now, in my opinion, the move is off, right? We ain't got no money. We ain't got no move. That, that, that's just how I am. My husband is different, though. He is a walk-by-faith type of person. I'm more of a walk-by-sight type of chick myself. But, I, you know, I had to, he's my husband. And so we had to go and move on faith. But I remember still making that move six months later. And we did not have the money. We did not have the money for six months. We could not afford to live in L.A., and I remember praying to God. I cried so much that first year. God, why haven't you provided the job? God, why haven't you done what you said you're going to do? Why, why are we in this situation? You told us to move up here. I trusted you. And you're not keeping up your end of the bargain. And one day, I remember the Lord told me, Tiana, I need you to hear this. I need to hear what you're doing. You are actually praying to be delivered from trusting me. You are praying, Tiana, to be delivered from trusting me. Now, church, I'm not saying that we don't pray for jobs or provision. We do, but it's a heart posture. I was miserable having to solely rely on Jesus, even though we never lacked anything. All our bills were paid. People showed up for way, in ways that we couldn't even have imagined. We never lacked anything, but I was miserable having to solely rely on him. I didn't want to depend on God. I wanted to do it myself and all of us do this. Listen, if you are in a season of delay and you feel like God has not moved the way you wanted him to move, then, then you know at a ground level, it is painful. I know that. And you have gotten weary and tired, but you need to realize that it's the grace of God. 
There is a beauty in dependence on him. There was a beauty when we recognize we need him. The delay of God is the grace of God in disguise because the delay of God is simply an opportunity to depend on God. It's an opportunity to depend on God. Y'all, that's where you actually begin to believe him. That's where you grow in this season you're in right now. That's where you learn to trust him. That's when you see, oh, wow, he is faithful. That's when you see, oh, all his promises are yes and amen. This is the season where you see, oh, he meant it when he said that all things would work together for my good. This is the season where he meant it that he would take care of me in all my needs. This is when you realize he's a sustainer. So let me say to you, don't rush out of seasons of delay because there are often times where you're able to feel most his delight. His grace is still all in this thing. Listen, the second thing we see his glory in this story of suffering from the aerial perspective is the glory of his grief. John eleven thirty two 32 to 37 says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come along with her weep, weeping also, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? From the ground perspective, this is a heartbreaking scene. From the it's all about us perspective, this is a heartbreaking scene. Mary and Martha are in the most painful moments of their life. Their brother is dead. And the one who could do something about it wasn't there. Jesus wasn't there. They, they don't know why he wasn't there. This is, we gotta put ourselves in their position. They don't know why he wasn't there. They don't, they don't know that. They weren't with him and the disciples, okay? So we're seeing an aerial perspective. They don't know why he wasn't there. All they knew was that in the hardest time of their life, the one who had the power to change everything didn't show up. That's all they knew. I can imagine them wondering, what was Jesus doing that was so important? Why? Why isn't he coming? I know he loves me, so why is he allowing this to happen? Why didn't he come? Why isn't he coming to save my brother? Have you been there? Right in the middle of your pain, wondering where is the one who can save me? Where is the one who can help me? Where is the one who says he loves me? Why isn't he showing up right now? Where is he at? He said he would take care of me. Where is Jesus? We have all been there in a situation where it doesn't make sense, in a situation where we know that if he would have just shown up then, everything would have been fine. If he would have just healed her, it would have been fine. If he, if he would have just saved the marriage, it would have been fine. If he would have just done this or done that, it would have been fine. If he would have just done it, it would have been fine. The ground perspective is rightfully heartbreaking. But I want you to look at this from Jesus' perspective. He wept. Some of us have heard this story a thousand times, so we can easily skip over how big of a deal this is, but I want you to sit in this for a minute. Jesus saw his daughter weeping at his feet. He saw his other children weeping all around him, overcome with grief and sadness. The scripture says he was deeply moved and troubled. In the Greek, it means he, it was this word that's used to describe he was angry. Most commentators would say he was angry at death. He was angry at the consequences of living in a fallen world, angry that the loved ones he, he, he had loved had experienced this deep, deep wound. He felt for her. And then he wept with her. And then together, they went to see where her pain lied. He said, where have you laid him? In other words, Jesus is saying, daughter, take me to the source of your deepest ache. 
Daughter, take me to the place that has absolutely wrecked you. Take me. I want to walk with you there. Where have you laid him? I want to walk with you to that place. Pay attention to this. In the first perspective, she was a victim of Jesus. Why didn't you come and save me? Why didn't you do this? In the first perspective, she's a victim of Jesus. And in the second perspective, she's a companion with Jesus. I want you to pay attention to that. In the first perspective, in the ground perspective, she's pointing her finger at God. You didn't do this. You didn't do this for me. In the second perspective, she is hand-holding with God. And he's taking her to her pain. He's, she's hand-holding with God. It all depends on how you look at it. Listen, suffering is a part of the gig. It comes with living in this fallen world. The Bible says all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus said that in this world you will have trouble. Suffering is a part of the gig. There's no way around that. But there is a way through it. Jesus says, I want to hold you through it. I want to hold you through it. But what happens is that we get so wrapped up in our perspective that we end up bypassing his hand in order to accuse his heart. He said, I want to hold your hand through it. I want to hold your hand through this mess of a world, but we get so frustrated. We bypass his hand and accuse his heart. We blame him. Listen, the last thing we see in this text, we see the glory of his gaze. In this story of suffering, we see the glory of his gaze. Look at John 11, 38 through 45. It says, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stove, stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, uh, by this time there was a bad odor for he's been there Four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did and believed in him. Well, this is the moment, church. From a ground perspective, this is it. This is the moment Lazarus has been raised from the dead and Mary and Martha's suffering is over. This is the moment we all wait for, isn't it? The moment uh, God resurrects the dead things in our lives and then brings an end to all of our pain. This is what we all pray for. What all of us fix our gaze on, the moment suffering begins is the moment that it will finally end. That's what we do. But what I love about Jesus, church, is that the resurrection was never his end game. The resurrection of Lazarus was not his end game. His gaze was never on the resurrection. I mean, sure, he loved Lazarus and he wept for all their pain. But if you pay attention, you'll see the only thing Jesus ever cared about was getting people to believe in him. He wanted to draw men to him. He said it to the disciples. He, he said it to Martha and in his prayer that he just prayed right before raising Lazarus. It was the only agenda of his heart. Resurrection was not the end game from God's perspective. Resurrection was just a means to restoration. Resurrection was just a means to restoration. It's what he needed to do to continue to restore all men back to himself. Look at John 12, 17 to 18. It says, now that the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. What a beautiful statement. 
that so reflects the desire of God's heart. This is what Jesus' eyes are fixed on the whole time. The whole world going hard after him. But it would not have happened without this death. It would not have happened without this pain that Mary and Martha had to endure. It would not have happened without them testifying of how God used it for the glory of his name. You see, this is why we cannot be the main character of our own story. Because God is supposed to be the main character, church. Sometimes he allows us to go through things for the glory of his name. Sometimes he allows us to go through for the glory of his name. It's not about us. It's not about us, but we tend to make it about us all the time. But God says we do, sometimes we do these things for the glory of his name. But get this, Jesus is not asking us to do anything that he hasn't already done himself. In John 12, 27 to 28, he says, now my soul is troubled. This is right before he's going to die. He says, now my soul is troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. So Father, glorify your name. Father, glorify your name. This is what Jesus is saying. He says, you can't save me from the suffering, Father. Glorify your name. Listen, we need a generation of Christians that will cry out, I don't care what happens to me. Just like Jesus, Father, glorify your name. We need a generation of Christians, church, that care more about the glory of God than they do the good of life. We need a generation of Christians that says, I don't care if it costs me my health. Father, glorify your name. I don't care if it costs me my job. Father, glorify your name. I don't care if it costs me my friends. Father, glorify your name no matter what it's going to cost me I want your glory I want your glory in and throughout my life Father glorify your name because listen we are not the main character he is so I say this to you in love it's not about you I know that life is hard right now. I know that it's, it's painful right now, but it, it's not about you. I know that it feels like you cannot go on, but you gotta listen. You have to, it's not about you. He's doing something. He's doing something. His grace is there. He's weeping with you. And he's trying to lead you to be a person that says, God, no matter what, no matter what happens, glorify your name in me, in my suffering, in my story. The backwards kingdom says it's just not about us. And church, we have to start to live into that truth. He is faithful. He is good. You are not alone. And he will carry you through whatever it is you're going through. It's not about you. It's about him. And he will be faithful. Let's pray. God, I thank you. God, I thank you that you're so faithful. God, I thank you that you have something bigger going on. Lord, I thank you for the revelation, Lord, that no matter what hard things we go through down here, God, that you will be faithful to us. You will be good to us. But God, would you free us from this mentality that it is all about us? God, would you free us from our own perspective, God, that we will begin to see that you are a God who uses pain, who uses suffering, who uses hard things and promise to work it all together for our end. God, I pray for strength right now, for strength to those who need it. You are good, you are faithful, and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, New Hope.